you know, like, I hate having to pay for parking. Yeah. I shouldn't have to pay for everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the past, I gave them uh, ten dollars of to parking tokens, you know, for like individuals to come to a meeting. I realize it doesn't pay for my hour and a half, but you know, thank you for coming. And I don't know whatever became of them, but yeah. you know, it seems like people that show up. I mean, unless they're with the agency or somehow being compensated. But, that and Ms. Williamsport residents, maybe you'll come back at night and get dinner or something. You know. <laughs> there you go. I'm awful Republican. You know. <laughs> we want a repeat customer. Hi, Britt. Hello. Hi, good morning. How are Good. How are you doing? Uh, doing well. Doing well. First, I'd uh, like just to identify any uh, of the additions, changes to the agenda that was not previously uh, posted, and they are in the clerk of courts, reclassify, reclassify clerk three part-time to a clerk three full-time, effective 125-22, and that'll be a TDA action uh, in DPS. Tyler Fetterman tele as telecommunicator two, full time position, 1975 an hour, A grade seven, effective 25 January 2022. That'll be a personnel action. And there's also a vote to approve agreement with National Medical Services Inc. Um, and that's going to be an action. Yeah. I'll move to approve the changes to the agenda. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Ask 
you please rise for the opening prayer and pledge allegiance. Before we have our prayer, yesterday we received sad news that Curly Jett, former chief of police for the city of Williamsport, had passed. Curly was a husband, father, grandfather, friend, and neighbor. He was a larger than life figure that made a positive impact wherever he went. Curly loved his Lord, his family, and his friends. At this time, I ask you to bow your head in a moment of silence for our friend Curly Jett. He'll be sorely missed. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll guide and bless our meeting this morning. Lord, may your face shine upon us with your grace and mercy. We pray that we will feel your presence with us throughout the day because you are with us wherever we go. We ask that this meeting focus upon your plans you have for us. Let our actions be positive and build and help each other. Lord, we remember the Jet family this morning. We thank you for Curly's life and the positive impact he had on our community. Please comfort his family and his friends and provide them peace. May we all remember Cur Curly's legacy by helping one another, sharing a warm smile, and demonstrating his love that he had for his fellow man. Lord, this morning we honor an employee for service with the county and we thank you for her and all our employees that provide services to everyone in the county. We thank you for their dedication and hard work. We pray for their health, safety, and your blessings upon them. Humbly present these things in your name. Amen. Please, 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 in favor say aye. 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 And that pass for public comment on agenda agenda items only at this time. Okay, Gary Nunn, is there any online? No. Yes. We're going to move on to we're gonna postpone two point out. Unfortunately zero is out. Okay. We wish her a speedy recovery and Hope to see her here in the next week or two. Okay, 3.0, data opening. Uh, Krista Rogers, bridge bundle number two, general construction. We have two bidders. The first is Walnut Construction Incorporated. There was no price submitted. The second bidder is Glenn Hallbaker Incorporated, and uh, there's various items listed on the bid result summary. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, 4.0, accounts payable cash requirements report. Randy. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I'm here to present, or I'm not physically here. I'm presenting the eight-week census report for invoices due through February 2nd, 2022, to be paid on January 26th, 2022 in the amount of $1,118,050.94. 32% are county general funded expenses, 32.11% are grants and other sources, 25% is RMS, and about 2.2% uh, is escrow payment. Okay, questions? I have a motion. I'll move to approve. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to information at 5.1. Sarah Johnson, uh, Gypsy Moss, and the potential impacts in Lycoming County. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you please come up to the podium sure, and yes. introduce yourselves? Because we're live streaming. Oh, thank you. I will hand these to you as well. This is some information that I am going to go through. Can I have a packet for commission? Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Sarah Johnson. I work for the Bureau of Forestry in the Forest Health Division within the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. I am based in the Tioga State Forest Office in Wellsboro, and I cover the Susquehannock, Tioga, Lo Loyal Sock, and Tiedotten districts, which is McKean to Bradford plus Sullivan and Lycoming counties. Uh, I work very closely with uh, the rest of the field staff in Pennsylvania um, for the Forest Health Division with Gypsy Moth, which uh, we now, the Entomological Society of America has discontinued the use of the, uh, the word Gypsy Moth. Um, we now use Lymantria Dispar, Dispar, the scientific name, uh, and, but they have not chosen a common name yet. For ease of referencing it with everybody today, I'll continue to use Gypsy Moth. The information that you have in front of you uh, is about the life cycle and about the outbreak that we're currently seeing. In the life cycle, that is there to illustrate uh, where we're at now and then where intervention occurs. Where we're at now is in the stage where there are only egg masses. Uh, that's what's out there. That's what we're relying on to show impact. Uh, the stage where intervention occurs is when there are small caterpillars in the May Time frame. So we're looking at, uh, you know, between now and May, uh, if anybody wants to plan intervention, uh, that's a, by our timeline, by the state's timeline, a, a pretty short time window. Uh, for looking through these maps that I have on that first page, this was our suppression program where we sprayed aerially uh, um, insecticides last year. So that shows where uh, there were several spots in Lycoming that were uh, pretty in much in, in great need of spraying. We used both helicopters and fixed wing uh, planes. And uh, if you continue on, you can see on the next page a more close up view of where the problem areas were in Lycoming County. Uh, that was last May. The third map is, and then the fourth one show where all gypsy moth hit really, really hard last June, which uh, if you have oak trees around you uh, in some of these areas, you probably notice that uh, they, they really prefer oak. They also will hit beech, black cherry, some understory species. And there was a lot of defoliation in Lycoming County last year. We had a lot of calls. Uh, we, uh, people kind of didn't see it coming. There was sort of a perfect storm of situations that led up to a lot of us being pretty surprised by this outbreak happening. Um, we usually fly in planes to map this defoliation data. For two years now, we have not been able to use planes to figure out the scale of the defoliation problem. So in 2020, when this was building, we didn't have planes and we couldn't uh, see that there was probably some initial defoliation and problem that would have led us to know what kind of problem we were going to see last year. We, we uh, had to do it all from the ground, and that was not ideal. Uh, all this you see that was mapped in these, in these maps from last year, this was all done from the ground again, unfortunately. Uh, but it was a, it's a large-scale problem that we probably missed quite a lot of. Um, moving to uh, this year and this surveys that we've been doing this winter, looking for egg masses, um, if you can skip the statewide view, although that gives you a picture that this is a statewide outbreak. This is a, a statewide problem focused obviously in the really mixed oak areas of the state, but this is happening all around the state. Uh, in Lycoming County in particular, we're looking at more into the western part of the county uh, and the southwest part of the county is particularly bad. Um, the current suppression plans that the state has for May are in the last two maps. Um, and you can see that it is larger than what we did last year, although much more than this is proposed. Um, we had to, because of funding constraints, we had to cut statewide out of the state spray program about almost 300,000 acres. Um, part of that acreage was going to be sprayed on game commission lands, which historically, since the 70s, the DCNR has handled spraying on 
all public and private lands as well. Um, but this will be the first year that we are not handling the spray on game commission lands because if they do their own program, we can get their acreage done. If we would have had to do it, we probably would have had to cut most of their acreage, unfortunately. So they're able to get done most of what they want to spray because they are uh, doing their own program for the first time in the history of the spray program in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's the last page includes some resources there uh, for your perusal and then there's a, a map of our areas you can see the area that I cover myself and a forester plus the rest of our field staff we have a larger forest health field staff than most states in the east um, and we are the go-to contacts for things regarding gypsy moth um, our overhead in the in the forest health division has a lot of history with the gypsy moth spray program and if there's a question that that I can't answer, I can um, direct it appropriately. Uh, what happened in 2019, 2019 was the last year that we sprayed any private land. The, the funding was, was leaving for that. The, uh, our ability to handle that was leaving when we had made the decision because of that to not spray any more private land as of the last end of the last <coughs> year, 2019. It ended in the last year, actually stick around in the east eastern part of the PA a lot longer. When that happened, we had a reprieve in 2020. And as I said, in 2020, we kind of didn't realize that there was going to be the outbreak happen because we couldn't fly. Uh, the weather conditions led to that outbreak really ramping up very quickly. And we were sort of caught off guard. So what we produced to help people in pursuing private spray programs, uh, the last two items in your packet are, are two things that were produced among other resources um, to help folks out with who to know um, who to call there's a list of aerial applicators this includes both rotary and fixed wing all these folks are licensed to aerially spray insecticides in pennsylvania uh, so landowners can can use this to set up their own spray program for just themselves uh, the issues that arise are, uh, the, the biggest issue to me is the issue of economy of scale. If the state has one giant contract for everything, obviously we can get a, a good price. Um, we were having, at the end of the time that we sprayed private land, we were having to pass 100% of the cost onto the private landowner. There was no cost share. There's not been any cost share from the state or the feds for many years uh, and also another constraint of our program was that we could not spray the more effective chemical insecticide called mimic on uh, private lands we had to use the, the less effective the uh, ET it has less amount of target impacts so a lot of private landowners you know if, if they had a real problem we weren't able to spray a more effective chemistry on their land just because of our constraints so that lack of cost share, the lack of the use of the effective, more highly effective insecticide, uh, does mean that if people don't participate in the public program, they can have a little bit more flexibility. And, and they can, uh, if they get that economy of scale, they can get a good price and get the right chemical for their needs. Um, building that economy of scale kind of depends on having a lot of folks get together and, and do a program together. So the last thing we've provided is what what I I look at this and I, I think it's, it's this is not everything that you need. This this last this guide to conducting a private spray program. There's there would be a lot more um, guidance that would be provided. Uh, I would be very willing to provide that if like Homing County were going to conduct a county level spray program. I tend to think that if there's going to be a, a good economy of scale with a spray program, you might want to join up with say Clinton and or Tioga uh, to do something like that. But if you're going to run a county wide program, um, you know, I would be very willing to, to help and to add to this guidance <coughs> that we have put together because I think there's a lot more that you need to know. Um, to get that done. Some of the things to consider with that would be uh, 
there's the cost of the contract, but there's also the cost of county uh, personnel overhead. Your salaries and benefits, your time and travel, your equipment and supplies. Matt, as the director of the conservation district, is who DCNAR has listed as the county level gypsy moth coordinator for Lycoming County. So his time to put together the program, which would be significant, uh, would be a cost that would that we had tended to pass on to taxpayers uh, when the state ran it. Um, you, I, I tend to believe that if, if folks are going to be part of a program that the full cost, the overhead plus the spray, uh, might be more appropriately passed on to the landowner in that case. Um, but that would be up for a county level decision if the county dis would decide to cost share that for the landowner to cover the overhead but not the cost of the contract or to do some combination. Um, it would it would probably fall to Matt or whoever he would delegate to to do all that overhead work. Finding the landowners, drawing the spray blocks, working with the contractor, it would be a fairly significant amount of work. When the state puts together a program, we are under a lot of uh, pressure to do it most effectively and safely as possible, so we add quite significantly to that overhead by weather monitoring and block development monitoring and safety measures during the program that add a lot of uh, time and travel to our overhead costs. Um, but when private folks follow the state program and spray, they don't do any of that extra monitoring that we do. So that would cut significantly from the overhead if uh, folks were going to be in a, in a county level private program or a, a private level private program. There are several consulting foresters that are doing their own private programs around the state. Um, that's kind of the background. Uh, I want it to be more brief in the overview, but it's, it's a lot. There's a big history and there's a, quite a large problem in Lycoming County. Uh, the problem will probably stick around for at least another year, if not two more years. Sarah, a couple questions for you. Why why did they not change the name? Why are they not referring to it as a gypsy moth? I mean, it's, the reason I'm asking is it's so hard to get education out to the public. So now it's like we're More switching gears. Difficulty. <laughs> right? And then yeah. the other question is, maybe you can just in a briefly explain the threat. The public that's watching this now has never heard of gypsy moth. Mm -hmm. We've heard of it because at CCAP we've talked about it. But I guarantee you nine out of ten of our constituents have not heard about it. What is the threat? What is the damage that's been done in other parts of the state? <laughs> and you know, what's the threat? If I own five acres, does it matter? I mean, I, I, I if I have a thousand acres and I'm raising oak trees for uh, commercial purposes, I'm very, very scared. But should I also be worried if I, uh, you know, live on a couple of acres out here? Yes, it's a good question. So, uh, for the first part, the word gypsy is considered a racial slur, and the Entomological Society of America had a lot of pressure from the public and various groups to discontinue the use of that word as well as um, there's several other insects that the common names were discontinued as well. Um, there was another insect that a gypsy was in the name and then there was a, a few more that were considered offensive by, by groups uh, and, and many members of the public so they um, have, even though they've not chosen a new common name, there's been no movement on that, they have discontinued as of last summer the use of the word, uh, the use of the common name gypsy. So LD, we say LD now, just so you don't have a more confusing scientific name to deal with. And uh, mostly, we still say gypsy now. It just, we say, Education is hard enough without, you know, without there being zero uh, connection for, for a term. So that's the reason, but mostly we will still say gypsy. Uh, for the second part of your question, gypsy moth has been around for um, over 100 years. It was, it's a non-native species. It's the European gypsy moth. To add to the name confusion, there's also an Asian gypsy moth that is also Lymantria dispar, but it's a different subspecies. 
uh, it's not that one. We have the European gypsy moth here. It was brought in on purpose in Massachusetts in the late 1800s uh, to provide an alternative uh, silk source and has spread from there. Pennsylvania, uh, there's various portions of the, the federal control program. Pennsylvania, all of it is in the suppression portion. So we spray chemical uh, and biological insecticides to suppress gypsy moth in high priority areas. Other portions of the gypsy moth invaded range will be part of the slow the spread where they're spraying chemical pheromones uh, because there's not the populations, but they don't. They want to try to make sure that the gypsy moths don't continue to expand in their range. So they're spraying different, different things, but they're also it's an aerial application program. So this is a, a, a range-wide issue of the invaded range of gypsy moth, but Pennsylvania in particular is only in suppression because we have been fully infested, if you will, with gypsy moth for a very, very long time. Uh, the DCNR spray program, suppression program, started in the 70s. So we've been spraying for gypsy moth with planes and helicopters since the 70s. In the 70s and 80s, there was horrific devastation, 100% defoliation of almost everything, multiple years in a row. And if you have 100% defoliation of a hardwood tree, two years in a row, there is very high likelihood of mortality of that tree, uh, basically. So if you've got a thousand acres and your oak are, are part of your financial portfolio, yes, you're very worried, but if you've got five acres and you've got a couple oaks in it and they're right by your house and they get defoliated two years in a row, you're gonna have a, a hazard oak tree likely next to your house. So it's also a worry in that case as well. Um, they love oak, they also will eat uh, a wide range of other species, uh, beech, hop corn beam, they like apple, uh, black cherry. They will, will feed on pretty much anything and everything. There's places in the state that got hit so bad last year that they were eating very, you know, lowest level of, of non-preference. They were eating mountain laurel in some of these areas. Uh, and that is, that's a, that's a real concern. Usually trees, if they're otherwise healthy, will survive one year of even full defoliation. If your trees have to refoliate, if they are fully defoliated and they refoliate later in the year, it might look better to you later on, uh, but that uses up a lot of reserves. So if that happens two years in a row, you're talking really high chance that that tree's gonna, gonna experience mortality, especially if there's any other stressor, uh, like we've seen. Massively wet late season periods spot droughts in August, like happened in 2017. Uh, you know, th this is, um, it, they'll, their health will be so impacted by those two years in a row, or, or maybe even one year in a row, if there's other things going on, if their soil conditions aren't ideal, that they, uh, they will experience lots of mortality. So one of the classic examples that we talk about, there, when we used to spray the private land, there was, um, back in, Oh, classic example, and I'm blanking on the exact years. Before I worked here, and it was over a decade ago, I believe, and there was a massive outbreak in the central part of the state of Gypsy Moth, and the Sproul and the Mashannon, so Center, Clearfield, Clinton, that area, uh, we did not have any state money to spray for Gypsy Moth on public lands, but we had money to spray on private lands. So we had a spray program. We sprayed private lands, couldn't spray any public. The Michigan and Sproul districts are still salvaging oak that has died as a result of those couple years in a row of full defoliation. So the mortality could be spaced out over a longer period of time. You get some trees that are, say, 75% defoliated. They don't have to 100% refoliate, but there's a few branches here and there that have to refoliate. The next year they get 50 to 75% defoliated. The year after that they get 25% defoliated. And then, you know, two years later, there's, a, there's a, a moderate drought in the late season, and they up and die, and you're like, oh, my tree all of a sudden died. But all of those stressors have been building up over time, so maybe it doesn't spot and kill it right there, but you'll see a, a playing out of the mortality as a result of these years of gypsum foliation for probably the next decade or so. And it can, it, if, if there's, 
a high enough amount, like some of these egg mass counts are um, 5,000 egg masses per acre. Trees are just coated down in that, that southern, uh, southern portion, more over towards Clinton County. Um, there's been trees, I've counted 600 egg masses and just stopped because there's just, there's so much. Those trees will be bare in the middle of summer. Um, and there's a, a very high level of, a high level of mortality. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. When you all spray for these moths, can you also spray for the ash boring beetle and the spotted lantern fly? Or, you know, can we, you know, like short of silent spring spraying? Yeah. Um, for emerald ash borer, aerial spraying is not efficacious because they are protected inside the tree for uh, most of their vulnerable life cycle, their larval life cycle, they're inside the tree. Uh, if you would spray aerially, you're only depositing on the leaves and that won't be affecting them. Um, emerald ash borer is a bit of a different thing because it is a boring beetle, so it's in there, it's protected, you have to get a chemistry directly inside that tree to infect that. And the chemistry that works the best is about $600 per liter, and it goes into a tree at, at five mils or 10 mils milliliters per inch DBH, so it is a very, very costly treatment that would be pretty much the only thing that's gonna save an ash tree, so we can't really aerially spray for that. For spotted lanternfly, there were aerial trials that Penn State Extension conducted down in the Blue Marsh area downstate. Uh, they were not very effective, and it's because of where the spotted lanternfly kind of harbors on the plant and how it feeds on the plant. So again, if you deposit a chemistry on the tops of the leaves, it's just not impactful enough to make the, <coughs> the you know, like the risk of, of low and slow helicopter flight worth it to, to do that aerial application. Uh, spotted lanternfly is really um, very highly affected by systemic sprays. So it is an individual tree application, which ups the time you're taking, it ups the, so the cost and everything, but it's really easily killed um, by pretty cheap chemistries. Uh, but aerial spraying wasn't too effective for it. The last I, the last I had heard that trial finished up, I think a couple of years ago. But good question. And this might not be for you, but what needs to be done to commingle the public and private funding? Because if you look at up your area, like State Game Land 75, right, which is the largest in the whole state, you got 27,000 acres, and then the private around there, a couple hundred acres each, the farmers and, and all that property. So you're saying that the public money you can do the 27,000 acres, but then you can't touch all those several hundred acre parcels around there. That's a different pot of Money? Yeah, yeah, and it depends. I think that we used to get federal money that could be used across the board, okay. uh, that was allocated for whatever acres. We have not gotten that money in a long, long time. Now might be the time. It seems like they're really handing it out right now. Well, what we have seen is that they're really handing it out for things that don't involve insecticides. They don't want, they're defunding our hemlock woolly adelgid suppression program. Um, it's either flat or lower. We are uh, having to go to greater and greater lengths to justify the use of insecticides versus other methods, um, cultural, biological, et cetera. Uh, and it's not that there aren't folks in that we work with in the feds and the state and private, et cetera, that are really proponents of uh, integrating chemical control into all these other, you know, it's gotta be an integrated approach, um, but it's just the, the funding is ever decreasing for. It just seems companies. complicated to have to pick and choose state game land, again, with swaths of property that could probably be 10% of the county in one, not one drop of one application. Right, and, and that is, um, to me, it is about funding pots, yes. Uh, and if the, you know, if the state, if the legislature, you know, if there's an agreement that public taxpayer dollars will be used to spray privately on land, you know, o okay. But that's not something that is. Uh, there's a. 
that gets into like whether or not it's appropriate to for me to pay to spray trees that I'm not going to be able to harvest or, or you know I, that's that's a, a really hammer-handed <laughs> way to say it I guess but that's that land uh, if there's not the, 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 the public dollars allocated what's the highest priority trees to save trees that are in the public trust or trees that are only there for an individual landowner um, it gets uh, it gets into maybe complicated budgetary and ethical questions very quickly, um, but it's very it, it's a it's a great shame because what the private landowners had when they were part of the the full program was the economy of scale. If we have well, what I don't know is sort of the break even point. So if you have our contract at 200 whatever thousand acres, you can command over three years where you're guaranteeing a good amount of acreage to a contractor over three years and they can up their price per acre by 3% a year as agreed in the contract, you can command the best price. Um, if you have 100 acres and it's a single year contract, you're not going to get a good price. You might not even get anybody to, to buy, to, to, to work with you. Uh, if you have 500 acres, you're going to get, uh, you know, let's say for the purposes of <coughs> example, you got 500 acres, somebody quotes you 75 bucks an acre for a uh, fixed wing mimic, which is the cheapest combination of doing this. Uh, you got the 1,000 acres, somebody quotes you 65 bucks an acre. You got 5,000 acres, somebody quotes you 50 bucks an acre. You jump to 50,000, maybe the quote's still 50 bucks an acre. So your sweet spot is then 5,000 acres, basically. Um, I'm not sure where that break-even point really ends up, but to put together a program that would give you the best price, uh, it might be, you know, I'd be talking more acres than would sign up in one county, basically. Um, and then you could start to put together landowners in groups, say around game 175, or, you know, like the large chunks are what is really gonna max out the efficiency of that aircraft. So if you've got bigger chunks all together, if you've got a whole group of neighbors that want to go in, that is going to reduce your reduce your cost, reduce the, uh, uh, the basically fuel cost for the contractors. So then they're going to be able to lower their price per acre. So if we're not going to do it, what makes the most sense is to gain the economy of scale for the private landowner by putting something together at a larger geographic. You know, spatial extent than just a couple landowners together that work with the same consulting forester, pretty much. Um, and it is a it is a shame that you know I, I have my own thoughts about how and why and and what would be a good way for us to integrate the private program into the state spray program again. Um, but the long and short of it is, right now, we are maxed out on what we can do with only half of the public proposed acres to spray in the spray program. We had to cut, I think, 250,000 acres or 300,000 acres out, like I said, and then the 50,000 is what the Game Commission is doing. So we already had to cut so many of the acres that, you know, in the grand scheme are in the public trust and would be a higher priority than, than lands that are privately owned, not open to the public, not, you know, giving the multiple benefits back to the state like the state land acres are. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gray area there, I, I know, uh, but right now, even if we were wanting to spray private land, even if we had the money to spray private land, we couldn't logistically handle it. There's too much to spray generally. It's just the, the scale of the problem, the problem is huge right now. If we have a wet April to May, really hope for a really wet April to May, uh, that will really cause uh, something else that I had missed in my, my historical discussion of this was <coughs> that back in the early 1900s, a fungus called Anamophaga mimiga was introduced to help control gypsy moth. It took a long, long time, but it has built up to levels in the environment now where that is what causes that and a, and a virus called MPV nucleopolyhedrospirus, 
are what caused gypsy moth populations to crash here in such a short time where before it would be like in the same area there would be just year after year after year. Now they're, they're crashing fairly quickly, sort of similar to a native or naturalized insect like forest tent caterpillar possibly um, because of this virus and the fungus. Um, so if we have a wet spring, that fungus can be really active. Uh, the virus travels more easily with rain splash. If we have a wet spring, we could see a, a big shortening of this, but we don't know that until we get there, unfortunately. So that's going to be a big kicker is the weather in the spring. Thank you, sir. No problem. Uh, my contact information is on that last page. Um, and I have other of these handouts if anybody would like to pick anything up. Please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, for being very helpful. Yes. It's no problem. Great. Is Thank all you this for posted having on Conservation's? We can get it posted there. That'd be awesome. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks great. No lot. problem. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, continuing on from yeah. my uh, the information items, uh, the county will acknowledge. Uh, Bidding the Williamsport uh, Region Relief Well Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation and Replacement Project, which is a 2022 budget item. And the county acknowledged this that it will be requesting bids for food products 2022 budget item. Thank you. Moving on to TDA action the update to the TBA report. Um, the item is in the clerk of courts, reclassify clerk three part-time to a clerk three full-time effective 25 January 2022. Okay, that motion. I'll move to I'll second. Uh, I'm sorry. It's okay, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 It's carried and this time we'll recess Mr. Public meeting to a salary board. Is that what this is? That could be a different Okay, uh, commissioners are seeking your approval. Uh, the item we just mentioned in the clerk courts reclassify clerk three part time to a clerk three full time effective 25 January 2022. The proprietary's office. I'll second. So we have a motion by the controller, a second by Commissioner uh, Marabito. Any discussion on this? I was just going to mention that's in the, in the proprietary's office. Yes. And really necessary to have a full-time person there. Yeah, yeah. Big uptick, uptick in uh, criminal cases. And so trying to keep caught up. Okay, all their side? Aye. 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 So that is opposed? Okay, so that's carried for all. Adjourn the salary board at this time. We will reconvene the commissioner's meeting. We can go back to personal actions on seven. Yep. Okay, uh, commissioner seeking your approval uh, on the following action. In DPS, Tyler Fetterman as a telecommunicator two, full time position, pay grade seven, 1975 an hour, effective 30 January 2022. Okay. Can I have a motion to accept the telecommunicator position? I'll move to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carry. Thank you. 9.1. Uh, vote to approve subrecipient agreement with Lycoming and County Children and Youth Services. This is a 2022 budget item. Okay. Got a motion. I'll move to approve. Second. Clear side. Aye. 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 So carried. That's the 2022 budgeted item. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, acknowledge the assignment of Fred Holland from Murphy, Butterfield, and Holland, PC, 
to McNerney Page, Vanderlyn, and Hall. Uh, this is a 2022 budget of that. Okay. I'll move to approve the, to acknowledge the assignment. That's from the closing and to the board for the other side. I'll check it. Okay, all their side. Aye. Aye. So carried. 9.3, Commissioner seeking uh, your approval on the third amendment to agreement step incorporated uh, for uh, feedback funds. Okay, uh, motion. I'll move to approve. I'll check it. Dad, I am on the phone. This is Rochelle. Hi, Rochelle. Oh, hi. Thank you for joining us. We want to thank you and Steph for all your hard work and the uh, allocation of these funds. Uh, do you want to give a brief update? Yeah, so these funds are specific to the high need population, <coughs> which is under 30% of the area median income. And I would say <coughs> the majority of our um, applicants are actually in that 30%. And so we will not have a problem fund spending these funds. Our ERAV-1 allocations are um, nearing completion, so that's the 7.4 million. And so we are rolling on to start the uh, ERAV-2. Um, we have a couple questions for DHS because a couple of the landlord uh, items have been taken off, the new um, kind of information items that DHS <coughs> We have a meeting with them tomorrow. The other thing is, that uh, DHS, or sorry, the assistance office is now operating a water and sewer program called um, Low Income Water and Sewer. And we are coordinating with them to maximize the funds so that individuals can be pushed right into that program and for us not to be spending money on water and sewer backfills. And so we are working with the water and sewer companies on that end in the assistance office so that we can kind of maximize these funds for, um, you know, rental and other utilities that currently do not exist for folks. Okay. Rochelle, what about uh, individuals who may, have, may own a home or, or have a mortgage on a home? And they may, have lost, yeah, they may have lost yeah. their job through COVID, and uh, can yeah. they be assisted? Yep, so we do have funding for that. We actually um, sent out a press release last week, we're still waiting to see that in the paper, um, about the, uh, the CDBGCV funding, which is three months of funding for mortgage assistance, and that is for all areas outside of Lycoming, er, in Lycoming County, outside of the city of Williamsport, um, Loyal Sock, and South Williamsport, because they are their own entitlement communities. And so Montoursville, Jersey Shore, and the county has put funds towards that program, and we are accepting applications. The applications are on our website, uh, and it's three months of assistance for mortgage and utilities. So we definitely uh, want to make sure that folks know about that program and uh, get in. There is a significant amount of paperwork, um, but we are, you know, able to help um, homeowners with that. Exactly. Yep. The other thing is the PHFA. So the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency on February 1st will be opening up their mortgage assistance program. Their application process is online directly through their website. So that could be up for up to three months to assist those people until they found employment. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Rochelle, uh, Commissioner Maravito, we've talked about the um, case management and I view this as a unique opportunity for us to get people who are not working in our community uh, back working. I mean, obviously we're assisting the people who have lost jobs to COVID, but um, the case management, if there's anything that you folks find that you need assistance with, please let us know because when the money runs out, well, first of all, we have, a, we have employers that really need workers. Yeah. And, and a lot of the workers, you know, need job skill training and so forth. But if there's anything, we've talked at some of the meetings uh, on the uh, American Rescue Plan funds about trying to do something with workforce development. There's also the Workforce Development Board has got programs. But I just think if we got a carpe diem, right, seize the moment to 
try to get as many folks who have not been in the workforce on a regular basis or who have been you know, itinerant workers where they're in and out of the workforce to try to get them the skill set to be able to be in the workforce uh, on a regular basis because when the money runs out uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of people who are going to have problems with a place to live. So I know you're working on that. And if you could just let us know if there's anything you need from us. Yeah, and so, Commissioner, we do have a, a really great template for um, that in, in terms of the youth. And so the youth program, which is Youth Enrichment for Success, which the Children and Youth Health Fund, is a great program that really gets youth who are on the verge of dropping out or maybe in um, trouble with juvenile probation uh, to really assess their needs and then do job skill training. And so, you know, it's not unreasonable for us to really look at an adult program in that. I can say all the individuals that are going through ERAP are getting goal plans and we're actually, the average amount of months that we are helping is 6.7. And so that has an increase, and so we are getting people back to be able to um, to pay for their own rent uh, and utilities. And so that's really a goal as well because we have a significant amount of applications. And so, you know, if we can help somebody through, you know, their tough time, then we're able to help more people in the county because there's a significant amount of need. So is that when you, I, 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 uh, I think that's great what you suggested about the YES program, an adult version of it. Are you putting that together or is it something you would need uh, assistance I from mean, us? Honestly, I just thought about it when you mentioned it. So, okay. um, you know, I think that it's something that if the commissioners would like to pursue, you know, I know CareerLink has other programs. We just know the model of the YES program has worked very well for the youth in this county. And so it may be something, you know, offline for us to have a conversation about, you know, what does that look like on the adult end? I think that would be great if you want to contact uh, Cindy upstairs and, and uh, we could sit, have, a, have a meeting about it because um, we have so many employers that are gonna need people and, and, uh, and these folks, it's a great chance for them to get the dignity of a job that's permanent and so forth. So that's great, Michelle. Great. Michelle, just as a reminder, what's the total funding amount for ERAP 2? So the total funding amount for ERAP 2 is um, just over $6 million. Okay, thank you. And that's with this additional allocation of or $293,788. And so as I said, we are nearly done with the $7.4 million. And so we're basically putting out between um, about $200,000, on average, $200,000 a week to landlords and utilities. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, I have a meeting at 11. That's okay, so. we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Any other additional questions for Rochelle? Okay, hearing none, uh, can I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. 9.4. Uh, Commissioner's senior approval on the grant and monitoring agreement with West Branch Hardens Association. This is a 2022 budgeted item. Uh, this is a grant in the amount of 15000 Okay, it is a 2022 budgeted item. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Jacket. Any further discussion? I believe this is coming out of our S13 fund. Correct. We we do this to help our volunteer fire companies. This organization uh, is the, one of the organizations through which they uh, do training and other things. We want to thank our volunteer firemen. Uh, once, with, once was 300,000 statewide. It's down to 30,000 statewide. It's it's a lot of dedication, a lot of money out of their pockets for training and equipment. It takes a special person to do this. It's, it's very dedicated work. It's very hard on their families. And we want to thank each one that is a volunteer fire person. Absolutely. Okay, got a motion. I'll move to approve. Yeah, get all there. Say aye. 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 So carry. Nine point five. Uh, seeking your approval on the agreement with National Medical Services Inc. This is a 2022 budget item. Okay, got a motion. I'll move to approve. 
Did I get in any discussion? I didn't hear you none. All bear side. Aye. Aye. So carry. And 9.6, Jason, are you still on? Yes, sir. Commissioner is seeking your approval to read 2022 Western Star Roll Off Truck, which was presented to you for the 2022 budget. Purchases through the Coast Guard program. The initial truck price is $198,253. After our trade in, we are trading in three trucks. This one brings it to a cost of $152,653. Okay, so this is a budgeted item for 2022. Okay, we have a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Any further discussion? Of course, this comes out of our revenue at the landfill, not out of our taxpayers' real estate taxes, and it's another tool that they need to be able to do what they're doing at the landfill. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, 10.0, Commissioner Common. Thank you. I don't have any at this time. I don't have anything at this time. Commissioner? No. Okay. And public comment at this time. Okay, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Thank you for joining us, Scott. Scott Miller, 822 Tucker Street, Williamsport. Accountability. Physical accountability. Some years ago, a pipe owned by the Williamsport Sewer Authority going under the Susquehanna broke, and the rate payers had to pay a fine that the EPA imposed. Who's accountable at the Sewer Authority? Why should, you know, I can't touch the pipe. Even if I had the money, the knowledge, the experience, the crew, I can't touch it. Same with the pothole in front of my house. I'm prohibited from fixing it. But I can't force the people responsible to do their job. But if my car gets damaged, I have to pay for the car. And I can hear it now. I don't know if the solicitor is around, but, you know, sovereign immunity. You can't sue the government. When my daughter went to Sheridan Elementary, there was problems with the roads there. I had to purchase an MUTCD, Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices, to prove to the city and the school board that I was right, that this is a problem that's supposed to be addressed. And I never got my money back. The reason I bring these things up is I'm cheap. I refuse to pay Comcast $100 a month to watch TV. I bought a little antenna. TV stations that are coming from Bald Eagle Mountain kept going out, kept going out, kept going out. I thought, well, get a better antenna. Well, I went and spent $140 for a better antenna mounted on the outside of my house. I mean, you can look from where it is to Bald Eagle Mountain. Uh, I went on a website that shows where the transmitters are. Same thing. Every now and then, TV stations go out. I filed a complaint with the FCC. Oh, well, you know, like, you're just a public person. We don't care about you. So that brings me to y'all. I, as an American citizen, have the right to the free use and enjoyment of the airways as defined by code, regulation, law, whatever you want to call it. And if I have to buy another TV to see if it's my TV acting up, and I find out that it isn't my TV, who compensates me? Who do I sue? If I have to hire somebody to figure out who's interfering with that signal, you know, and trace it back, who do I get compensated when I say, well, this person, that person, or them? Or is the cause of me losing my right to the free access and use of the airways, the public airways? Um, don't know if y'all remember, TVs used to go up to channel 83. The government sold off from 70 up for cell phone carriers. 
I didn't remember seeing the check. Mm -hmm. And so my question or request of the county commissioners is to ask the FCC to find out why the TV transmitter up there on Bald Eagle Mountain is randomly, occasionally going out. I notice a lot of times it's 9, 9.30 in the evening, but sometimes just during the day, you know? And who's going to pay for me to get Comcast, pay the $100 a month here to eternity to be able to watch what I am supposed to be able to watch and see with the use of my $140 antenna, you know? And, you know, I mean, I can just see you know, like if I found out that it was a company, sure I can sue the company, but the government licensed these companies. The government is supposed to do for people what they cannot or will not do for themselves. You know, an analogy I make is I couldn't defend the United States of America by myself against the Russian invasion. We need a government. It would be cost prohibitive for me to find out who's doing this, you know, the equipment, et cetera, et cetera. And much like my manual for uniform traffic control devices, I have not seen anybody rushing to give me my $150 back after I proved it. So Scott, I think <coughs> some of it may be weather related. No, no, it's no, not it's weather, it's, it's not, not weather. Because right, I've, I've noticed that, that TV lose channels with weather. I didn't grow up here, so I'm sort of curious, in the 1950s, what did people use for television here? Did they have, uh, did they have antennas, or did they use, I know cable originated, by the way, in Pennsylvania, it originated up. I'm uh, not, I didn't grow up here either. I grew up in a sweet spot between Baltimore and Washington. I got the Baltimore and Washington channels, and so, but uh, I know I have the right to the airways. Initially had, uh, Antennas way, way, way back. And then the cable came into the area. And uh, basically, one cable company ran everything. Yeah. And uh, that was that way through, I think, pretty much 60s and 70s until it started to change in the early 80s. Yeah. But before people. I mean, you had channel 2 through 13, that was your cable. Right. That was your cable. And then early 80s, it exploded, and you started having all the multiple cha channels. But did you have antennas in two in the fifties and sixties? Well, I wasn't born in the fifties, but from what I was told, <laughs> there was antennas. Some people are still using antennas that just got. It. Yeah. Well, I mean, I hope y'all can understand, understand my yeah. frustration. We can ask the congressman. The the, the place you oh, really God. need to take, you need to call Representative Keller's office because it's a federal agency, and those are the people. His staff people are the ones who are able to pick up the phone and get the FCC on the phone, just like we can We can sometimes pick up the phone and get various um, federal agencies on the phone. We'll try, we'll try, but we'll call Representative Keller's office. I think you ought to call too as a constituent okay. and just say, it may very be, well be Scott, that they are no longer putting the money into upgrading antennas. I'm not saying this is the case because I don't know for a fact, but if they don't, if, they, if the majority of their business is in the cable realm, they may not be erecting new towers that have to, you know... It's like you can't get a hardwired landline phone anymore. Exactly. That's exactly right, because, because the, the phone companies want to be out of the landline business. Um, in fact, in some places like where I live in Kogan Station, you, you know, I have often fought with Verizon because constituents will call me and say they're 75 years old, their landline's out, and they say, Rick, if they're telling me it's going to take three weeks to fix it. So I call Verizon, and usually Verizon gets someone out there because as elected officials, they try to be responsive to us. They should be responsive to you, too, and, and we'll certainly try to see what we can figure out. Okay. I can't promise you that we're going to be able to get you a signal all the time, but we can at least find out what's going well, on. Well, I just want to know what's going on short of buying a new TV. Don't, don't, buy, don't buy don't buy excuse me for don't buy a new TV. I don't think yeah. it's your TV. I don't think so either. I'll tell you a little secret. I don't have cable either. And I have an antenna and sometimes that antenna just doesn't get a signal. 
yeah. and I look outside and, and I'll look at where the clouds are and that's just the the joy of some, which some of I, these times it's a perfectly sunny day yeah and the way I can explain some of it is is it starts the TV starts to snow up you know and like yes. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, and one of the things I've thought about, because I sit and think about this while I can't watch TV, is, you know, is if when businesses close or are at the end of the business day, you know, they're transmitting all their information via microwave or something, you know, to the corporate offices, God knows where, you know, what's doing this? Is it the TV stations? You know, and I assure you, I go online and like, hey, you know, I don't want to name any of the TV stations, but y'all know the local TV stations. I've sent all of them emails. Only one of them ever contacted me back and said, well, no, we didn't have any issues, you know, like from them to the transmitter that they were aware of, you know, like, you know, and they're the ones that suggested upgrading from the little indoor antenna to the big outdoor one, and I got the big old bracket and everything, you know, worrying about lightning hitting my house now. <laughs> That's a good point. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I can do it. Okay. Any other comments from the public in the audience or online? Okay, so <coughs> next week we will be moving our commissioner meeting in the future. Our commissioner public meetings will be on the Thursday. So we will not meet next Tuesday, and we'll be meeting next Thursday, which I believe is the 4th, February 4th, if I'm correct. Thursday? Yes. Thursday. 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 Yeah, Thursday. February 3rd. Thursday. Our, actually, our next commissioner's meeting will be Thursday, February 3rd at 10 a.m. Right. right here. So thank you for attending. And everyone stay uh, well and healthy and warm. Have a good day.